Hello, and welcome everybody. It's great to see you all. My name is Mark Sobel. I'm going to moderate the panel, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to not only introduce yourselves, but maybe talk a little bit about the cult you wrote about and why you chose to write about that specific cult. George, why don't we start with you and just kind of go down the line? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm George Wylisall. Uh, I'm an illustrator and uh, writer. Um, I live close to here in Baltimore. Um, I wrote a book in 2019 called uh, Internet Crusader, which tells the story of this like doomsday cult that like, I kind of, yeah, there it is. Uh, I kind of forget the details where it's like they, they kind of like uh, take over the internet. Uh, the whole book is told through um, like uh, retro like chat panels, IMs, uh, like kind of 90s internet style graphics. Um, and uh, yeah, I made up this like fictional cult that is like working with the devil and kind of taking over the world. Uh, hi, I'm Emmy Guinness. I'm uh, based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm a cartoonist and an educator at uh, the Columbus College of Art and Design. And um, a few years ago, I made a piece for an anthology called American Cults um, about the uh, Oneida cult in upstate New York. Um, that is uh, no longer in existence, but does still make uh, silverware. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, my name is Ellen Lindner. Uh, I am based in Upper Manhattan in New York City. I am also an educator. I teach design at Queens College and at City Tech in the CUNY system. Um, I am also an American Cult cast member. <laughs> Um, I wrote my story about Fruitlands, um, which was the cult slash commune founded by Charles Lane and Bronson Alcott. And it is the uh, experience that made Louisa May Alcott <laughs> decide that she could never depend on anyone except herself. <laughs> um, my name is Jesse Lambert. Um, I do, uh, I'm based in New York City in Queens, New York. Um, I do uh, memoir comics about my experience growing up in a psychotherapy communist cult um, known as the Sullivanians. Um, and um, just a side note that the name Sullivanians is not really a name that the group chose. It was a, a name that was um, given to the group by the media. Um, and. Um, my my work is really about uh, at least that the work that's memoir based is really about um, trying to center the subjectivity of um, cult survivors and um, you know uh, uh, to try to um, uh, give a personal experience of uh, instead of an outside experience more of an inside experience uh, uh, inside representation of the experience. Great. Oh, also, I'm, I'm also an American cult. Can we give a shout out to Robin Chapman, <laughs> yeah. uh, the editor of American Cult, who's in the audience? <laughs> so on this slide, one of the things that always gets focused on uh, in, when you're talking about cults is the charismatic leaders of these organizations. And I wanted to ask each of you, um, to talk about how you approached depicting these leaders in your stories and, and, and any challenges that you had. Uh, just going left to right, Jesse, I'll start with you. Um, I, I haven't actually done too much depicting of the leaders of, of the uh, cult that I mostly do work about. Um, so in, in my case, there were four leaders uh, that were married uh, couples uh, that were, uh, the cult was polyamorous, uh, so the married couple leaders were in open relationships, um, but they were all therapists, uh, therapists that trained other therapists within the, um, uh, the Sullivan Institute, which was kind of the, the core um, uh, institution within the cult. Um, and uh, there was one, one of the four was really kind of the, the, the main leader. And so in, in my short story in American Cult, um, I have uh, one image of him from a uh, news article. And then um, uh, I also have a, 
an image of his wife um, from another news article. So it's kind of filtered through how the media perceived them in, in my case. I'm also working on a longer um, uh, book length memoir where like I'll be representing them in more like personal interactions because I ended up spending a lot of time with them uh, since I was uh, good friends with their children. Um, so I don't know if that answers. But. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, George. Yeah, um, so this is the cult leader that I uh, invented, uh, Reverend Jefferson Pleasant. Um, he's like, just I wanted to, him to look visually like very creepy and uh, awkward. I kind of modeled him off of like, just like a gross priest or something, like a Catholic priest. Um, but he's like, he's like possessed by the devil. He's like the hand of the devil and he's not really charismatic. Um, he's a little more uh, like kind of dogmatic and scary. Um, He's not like uh, drawing people in with his charisma and wanting like, and people are like idolizing him. He's kind of tricking them and kind of like brainwashing them. Um, this is like, obviously like fictional. Um, so it's not kind of the same way how like a real cult works in the real world most of the time. Um, but it kind of ties into the, the plot of the story. Yeah, uh, Emmy. Uh, so uh, in de depicting the leader of uh, the Unita group, uh, this guy, Noise. Um, while I was doing my research, I found the diary of this woman named Tirza Miller, who was one of the cult members and also Noise's uh, niece. And so I ended up kind of portraying the lead, like not just the leader, but the experience of being the cult like through Tirza Miller's perspective. And so kind of showing uh, like her relationship with him, which kind of you know was, as you might imagine, complex and changed over time. Uh, it was uh, also a polyamorous cult, uh, and uh, Tears Miller described uh, in great detail her sexual relationships with many people in the cult, including her uncle, uh, the cult leader. And so uh, there are moments uh, in the comic where he seems like very scary and authoritative and there's other moments where he seems like very kind and intimate um, because she had all of those experiences with him and so I tried to show the the variety of the the types of relationships that he might have with even just a single member of the cult. Right, Alan. So, um... The head of the Fruitlands Commune was Bronson Alcott, who is um, best known today as being the father of Louisa May Alcott. And he was an educator and a social reformer in sort of early 19th century Boston. And he was a real idealist. Um, however, his idealism kept coming up against the reality of other people's needs, wants, and desires. So, um, when he was an educator, he actually did some really amazing things. Um, Boston in the early 19th century was very segregated, and he wanted to desegregate the school where he uh, worked. And that's an amazing thing. That was a really cool thing. However, the people who were around him were really nasty to him because of it, and he basically got driven out of Boston. And so his next step was to go to the UK and try and raise money to start his own commune. Um, and he hooked up with this guy called Charles Lane, who thought Bronson Alcott was absolutely amazing. And so they came back and started this commune. But just as Henry David Thoreau uh, was only able to write on Walden Pond because his mother was doing his laundry, <laughs> um, <laughs> the Fruitlands commune really leaned hard on the labor of the female members of the commune. And so my perspective telling a story was really influenced by gender because I could not go into this not feeling really aggrieved for these people who were forced to do laundry, cook constantly, do farm work, while the men of the commune were just kind of sitting around talking about their grand ideas. So that would be my, <laughs> my take on this. Uh, we can debate whether or not I was too harsh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's great, thank you guys. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the research that went into the stories that you all created. George, one of the things that really, and you all wrote from different perspectives. So George, you wrote a fictional version of a cult. And 
I wanted to ask you about the process because you created a very elaborate orthodoxy for this cult. So can you talk a little bit about what went into that process of creating your cult? Yeah, sure. Uh, so like my artistic practice is really focused on like design and type uh, uh, as well as drawing. So I really wanted this book, Internet Crusader, to um, really feel like the early internet, right? Like the 90s era internet. Um, in doing uh, a lot of research, I found um, like the active website that's still active today of the Heaven's Gate cult, like the famous uh, kind of suicide cult. Um, <clears throat> it has this horrible 90s web design, which like, like that coupled with like the crazy imagery and the apocalyptic text and everything, I just found kind of really compelling on an aesthetic level. Um, so I kind of developed this cult that's kind of like taking over the internet, the Church of the Holy Light. I had a lot of fun just like making their, like their doctrine and their beliefs. I did like this whole holy text like within the book that was just like uh, designed by like some web designer like in the 90s. Um, and I just had a lot of fun with like the, the buttons, like the things you click on and the clip art that's like stuck in there, the gradients everywhere, the backgrounds. Um, all that stuff was such a good vehicle for like just developing the language of, of the cult. Um, so it really kind of came from um, aesthetics first and then like the content came after. I think the, uh, the Internet Archive is such a great resource for like this kind of thing. So that was like, yeah, like, that was such a good, uh, good source to look at. They have GeoCities um, web pages archived, millions of them with just like pixelated angels everywhere that I was able to work in. So, yeah. Was it, did you do research into other satanic cults and were you modeling yours on any specific ones? I wanted to stay away from any like real world influence. I was looking at um, cults themselves and like how they work. Uh, I was also looking at just like religious doctrines and religious um, holy texts and uh, apocalypse, ap apocalypse myths and stuff like that. Um, I was kind of researching how like these 90s cults like Heaven's Gate worked uh, but I did want to stay away from like their specific, um, you know, the facts about them. That's great. Thank you. Um, Jesse, in your story, one of the things that really stood out to me is you talked a lot about um, the media and the media's perspective on uh, the cult that you were experienced with. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that and how that impacted you. Um, yeah, so uh, when I started working on this short story for American Cult, um, it was kind of the, the first somewhat longer uh, comic that I'd done on this topic, and uh, I felt really strongly that I wanted to sort of address the media perception and media representation of the cult and to kind of contrast that with my own subjective experience and experience of people that I knew. Um, so uh, that became like kind of the, the main theme for that short story. And it's also a theme that I want to explore somewhat in the longer, mem longer memoir I'm working on. Um, but it was super impactful uh, for people in the community. Um, uh, in the 80s, there was a lot of um, news, TV news and newspaper and magazine uh, coverage of the group because there were uh, a couple of very high profile child custody cases that happened and um, they, uh, they were between like parents that were in the cult and out, outside of the cult and so it became this very public thing and um, I was in kind of the end of middle school, beginning of high school at the time. And, um, you know, sometimes like news crews would show up outside of our communal building. Um, some of my friends in school were teased uh, or uh, shunned, um, disinvited to like birthday parties and stuff like that. So there was a lot of stigma that, that was um, kind of happening in real world time during all this coverage. And, uh, you know, as a, young teenager it was like super uh, affecting um, you know at a time when you're just starting to socialize and kind of navigate like the social world of school and peers and stuff so um, it uh, you know it, it for me it's a really interesting thing to uh, to contrast like a, an outside view of things and an inside view of things 
And that includes, when you're in a cult, having certain, like, kind of um, distortions of, you know, uh, what the cult is and maybe accepting certain things as non-cult-like. Um, but, um, but I think that's, like, just a very, like, um, uh, you know, it's a way of capturing, like, a very true experience of what it's like to be in a cult. And um, I'm also interested in kind of unpacking what happens when you leave and your views on what you experience change. Um, so, do, yeah. do you feel that the media coverage that you've seen and some of it you've included here is fair? Or do you think it's biased or is it um, something you know, else? It's, I, I'm, it's not really about fair or not fair. I mean, I think in, in a lot of ways, a lot of it is fair, you know, and, it's, and it is important to uh, critique or, you know, criticize controlling groups. Um, the, the thing that, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, being someone who grew up in that kind of context, um, you know, the thing that I think about is not whether it's fair or not fair, it's like what I think about is um, whether it's uh, objectifying or not and like how empathic the representation is. Um, so it's like in some ways it's kind of the style of the reporting. Um, less than the content. And um, there was recently a book that came out last, was it last June or the June before? I can't even remember. I think the June before about the Sullivanians and then there were all these book reviews that came out and a, a lot of the like book reviews like I really disliked for that reason of like the way that they talked about the story was kind of objectifying and treating trauma stories as entertainment. Uh, the New Yorker had a review and it was like, the one I, I dislike the most. Um, and of course, it's the one that comes like at the top of Google results. Um, but I thought it was a terrible art, art article and very unempathic. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I think about is, you know, I mean, it's important to be truthful and to expose abuses, but it's also not great if like victims are objectified. I wonder if, <clears throat> excuse me. I wonder if you all had a similar experience as you were uh, writing your stories in terms of uh, researching through media. Emmy, maybe you can start. Um, uh, like in terms of looking at how media at the time or was covering the cult or Yeah, and I mean, like maybe specifically for you and Ellen, you both focused on cults through the eyes of women authors or women writers. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that specifically. Uh, sure, yeah. It's interesting because um, uh, the, the cult that I was researching specifically, um, they existed, you know, around the 1840s and um, they, they had their own newspaper and they would like put out stuff about their own cult uh, for circulation amongst themselves, but also for circulation kind of, you know, almost as uh, propaganda sort of. And uh, the, the woman that I focused my piece on was a, a writer and editor for this newspaper. Um, and, uh, th but there was also, you know, discussion from outside of the cult about the cult. So, you know, at the, at the time that they created this community, um, you know, they had some similar to Ellen's cult, it sounds like, you know, they started with some like truly progressive, laudable ideals uh, that we like looking back today would be like, yeah, this is, I'm for this. Like the uh, John Humphrey noise was like, hey, you know, women actually aren't uh, different than men and maybe they're equal and maybe they can like do all the same stuff men do. Um, and like, that's cool, I like that. Um, he's like, maybe we shouldn't like, I don't know, force women to like be mothers and like have a bunch of babies if they don't want to. Like maybe we should practice like safe sex and birth control and no one should get pregnant if they don't want to. And it's like, hey, that, that's cool too. Um, and uh, the women, like they wore pants and they wore their hair short and they had all the same jobs in the cult that the men could have. And like, that sounds cool. And like in the 1840s, this is, bananas um, <laughs> and everyone thought they were absolutely radical so you know the outside world had a lot of very negative things to say about them um, some of them uh, 
absolutely fair, reasonable things, and some of them maybe less so. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think with most cults, and I'm assuming, Ellen, that this probably a similar thing happens with yours and with most cults, I find like a lot of cults, you know, like Jonestown, for instance, is another good example. Like we're starting out with like some cool progressive ideas and then at some point there's a left turn. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, every, anytime I'm researching anything that happens in the 1800s, I'm just leafing through it like, oh, that, that sounds cool. Cool ideas just waiting for the page turn where we get to eugenics because it's like almost there, always there. It's, so it's gonna happen. We're so close to being a good idea and then, oh, eugenics, there it is. Um, so that, <laughs> that's, you know, what, one of many things uh, where we have the left turn with this particular group. Um, but it's, it's interesting seeing the, how different groups of people are dealing with their their ideals and their tenets and their principles because I think there's a lot of like obviously very fair criticism to be made there but they they're also doing things that I think were like a, there there was a seed of like a good idea in there um, it's it's an interesting balance and and I agree with what Jesse was saying earlier that like you know maybe it's like less about what is fair coverage and like more about like what is empathetic and like humanizing and like looking at these people as like full human people that are out here like trying to make the right choice for like themselves and for their fami family and like, you know, trying to envision what uh, society could be or like what spiritual wellness is. Um, and very, I don't know if uh, any of that made sense. Uh, so. <laughs> Not obligatory. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me ramble. No, that's great. So, um, just to recap, for American Cult, and Robin can correct me on this, the sort of requirements for being considered a cult were maybe a little bit different from what we think of as a cult today. It was really about control. You know, like, was this a group where people were being controlled? And again, like you were saying, there's some good ideas and then they go a little left. So the people who founded Fruitlands were all abolitionists. And so they didn't want to use anything that had any um, root in slave labor. And so they wouldn't wear cotton, obviously, because that was basically entirely produced using slave labor. Um, they wouldn't use silk because silk was also used, uh, was also created um, using slave labor in the East. Um, however, they were also vegan because they didn't want to harm any creatures. And like Amia is saying, nowadays that sounds totally normal. In the early 19th century, people really took the Bible really seriously. And they saw diet and the, a man's dominion over animals as kind of a core human precept. And so being vegan was just like completely wild. One person did get kicked out of Fruitlands for eating a little bit of fish. So again, we're talking about a situation where people were really kind of like keeping an eye on each other. Um, in terms of media representation of this cult, um, Sadly, or maybe for the best, it flamed out so quickly. They were so incompetent at everything having to do with farming. Um, they had no clue that you could not start a crop in July. They were really sad when it came to farming. Um, there is an argument in Alcott scholarly circles that Little Women is kind of an idealization of the close-knit family bond that was created under this incredible stress of you know, the threat of starvation, the um, omnipresent uh, knowledge that they were in the midst of a giant financial failure. However, the dad is mostly edited out, <laughs> which I think goes to show how Louisa May Alcott felt about her father as a family leader. You know, he makes a cute appearance once he's come back from the Civil War, but mostly it's the women fending for themselves. And I think that's kind of what happened at Fruitlands as well. Yeah, and that's a, that's a nice segue to my next question, which is the treatment and depiction of women, both depiction in terms of how you wrote your stories and the treatment in these, within these cults. 
Ellen, maybe you can start because I have a couple of panels up here that um, are from your story that kind of show uh, some of the mistreatments about women, but can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Well, as with Emmy's story, diaries are available, and they're not nice depictions of the life of women at Fruitlands. Um, basically, <laughs> they're just like in this pat patriarchal setting where they're just getting lectured by men constantly while doing all their work. And I don't even know if there's more to say about it than that. <laughs> I mean, that would boil my blood. <laughs> that would be all I would need um, to be quite upset. And if anyone's familiar with Louisa May Alcott, at a very early age, she started writing potboiler fiction, anonymous stories that were incredibly sensational, written exclusively for financial gain, because she wanted to get the heck out of this crazy situation as quickly as possible. She had learned that her father, although very intelligent, very well-meaning, was not useful <laughs> as, a, as a dad. <laughs> And so she really quickly transitioned into wage earning uh, through her work. And um, scholars have found all these early stories, and they're completely bananas. Um, so good for her, you know? <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. But yeah, I think that this, the, these um, panels kind of paint a pretty accurate picture. Yeah, she was, she was not pleased. <laughs> Emmy, what what about in your story? Uh, yeah, the the treatment of women and and how women operated within the the cult at Oneida was uh, really interesting. Uh, as I said, for the time and like very progressive for the time. Um, sort of the origin of the the cult was sort of John Humphrey Noyes had this experiences like his wife had experienced some like really traumatic. Uh, pregnancies and like pregnancy loss and uh, he was became like very sensitive to the idea that he would put her through that uh, and that like he would preach about this and had there were lots of writings about this where he uh, was like how many women have we lost uh, that have just been broken by childbirth you know because it's the 1840s like women are having so many children and like dying early and um, and he was like, We're, we, we don't have to do that. Um, uh, so he, they ended up, uh, the cult, uh, they had a policy of um, uh, free love uh, was a big part of it, that uh, in, in the kingdom of heaven, everyone's married to each other. And uh, so, uh, you know, and I think part of that was like, you know, if his wife doesn't want to do certain things, he could do it somewhere else, and that's fine. And you know what, she could too, and that could be fine too. Um, and all of this sounds well and good. Um, and they had a system for this where um, an, an older woman, if a man was interested in a woman, he would go to an older lady and be like, hey, I'm interested in so-and-so, and then this older lady would go to the younger woman and say, hey, this guy's into, into you, you into it? And she could be like, no, no and then turned him down through there. And like Noyes' idea was that this would um, eliminate uh, a woman feeling like too pressured by being asked, propositioned by a man in the moment. Uh, and then a, a man would, it'd be like less embarrassing to be turned down by that. So it would just kind of save everyone the stress. And like, this sounds good in theory. Um, uh, and no one was required to have sex with anyone, which also sounds good. Like the idea here is like, okay, consent. We love this, cool. Uh, but the thing is, when you're the leader of the cult, when you're the voice of God, can you say no to that guy? <laughs> like, I don't think that's really consent. So it starts to get a little icky <laughs> uh, when you start looking at power dynamics. Um, but again, like seeds of a good idea, and then actually in practice, like does this actually work? I don't know. And they also had this, like, you know, we don't want everyone getting pregnant unnecessarily. And at first, no one was to get pregnant because they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford having children. And so 
they, he was, John Humphrey Noyce was like, nobody's getting pregnant. Everyone's pulling out. <laughs> Um, sorry to get like real spicy in here, but like I wrote about a sex cult, so like I don't know. Um, uh, but they actually, it, this is actually incredible. They had like an ongoing sex cult with like over a hundred members for I think the first like 30 or 40 years. They only had like I think less than five whoops babies. Like they were actually really good at not getting pregnant, but having an incredible amount of sex. So that's <laughs> honestly incredibly impressive. Um, so they had, there were children in the cult, and as they were growing up, uh, one of the policies was that the younger men, their first sexual partners, should be older women, because the younger men need to learn to their, their pull-out game, basically. <laughs> and this was, you know, to prevent accidental pregnancies. So, like, again, weird. I understand the logic. But then, also, the reverse was true, where it was like, oh, the younger women, their first partners will be the older men. Which doesn't actually seem like it has a practical reason for it. It's just creepy. It's only 100% creepy. The other thing also was creepy. But I at least understand the like logic on paper of it. But like this, just older dudes, like yeah, we're just gonna like have sex with thirteen-year-olds. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Um, and Noyce was later uh, 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 arrested uh, for sex being sexually inappropriate with children because uh, he was. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about like the treatment of women, and it, yeah. I guess it's the bad. <laughs> <laughs> but also, there were a lot of women in this group who, uh, you know, probably did not have a lot of other options at the time to do the kind of things that they could do in this group, to have the kinds of opportunities that they had. Because uh, once they got to the point where they were having children, which was its own things, again, eugenics, we, we can open that door later in the conversation, um, but once they did start having children, there was a, a, like a daycare, basically, like a place where the children were all kind of like raised together as a community, and it could be your job as one of the community members to like work in the child care area uh, so that the mother could like choose to do childcare as like her vocation, or maybe she works in the flatware factory, or maybe she writes for the newspaper, and she can have a child, but that does not take over her whole life and prevent her from becoming whatever it is that she is interested in becoming. Um, and that wasn't really available to women elsewhere at the time. Uh, so there's, it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jesse, you've said in your story that y you cringe when you hear the term sex cult. Mm. Can you explain why that is in, in regard to the Solovanians? Sure, um, but first I, like, I want to respond to something sure. that Emmy said w when talking about um, children and, and the role of children in cults um, because I, I, you know, when I read your story, and I knew something about Oneida before reading your story, I'd, I'd read quite a bit about them because of certain similarities to uh, Oneida with the Sullivanians. And um, so, you know, I was very interested in your story, but the, w w you know, what you were just saying about um, child raising and child raising in a communal way, um, there, like, I, I've, I've heard, um, I, I mean, I was a child within a cult, and I've heard from parents that there um, was something somewhat, especially women, something s s uh, somewhat liberating about um, being freed from a lot of the burdens of child care. And I think that that is, in some ways, a, a kind of positive or can be a positive side of this kind of like 
communal approach to family. Um, on the other hand, like, I think that children in cults pose a problem to the leadership because of the strong bonds of uh, parents and children. And in many cults, uh, there are like really specific ways of creating separation between parents and children in order to sever that bond um, because that bond is, is threatening to the leadership. So, you know, the, the, the strong attachments that cult members have are supposed to be towards the leaders and towards the community. Um, and children become a problem for cult communities. So um, I want to like acknowledge what you're saying about the kind of liberatory side of that, because I saw that in my own experience and heard it from people of my um, mother's generation, mm -hmm. but uh, within the Sullivanians, but to also like being a child in that community and having a lot of children, you know, knowing a lot of other children in that community, friends of mine, peers who um, uh, were put in positions where they, uh, you know, did not necessarily, a lot of times in, and <clears throat> I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't really know in terms of Oneida, but in the in terms of the Sullivanians, um, there was a lot of talk about how this was better for children to be raised communally, but in practice it actually wasn't. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of like a, a line for the community uh, that this was a good thing. And maybe there, I, you know, I can see some things that were good, but there were some things that were incredibly damaging because the separation from parents was just so drastic. You well, know? you were yeah. sent to so, school so young. Well, yeah, maybe I didn't, I didn't uh, mention that in uh, my intro, but in the Sullivanians, um, there were kind of like two methods of dealing with children. So in Oneida, maybe it was kind of this communal child raising, and I don't know. I, I got a I reread your story, and I got a little bit of a feeling from the story that when um, I forget her name, when she had the baby, that uh, she was being pressured. That somehow the baby was was a like a conduit back to having strong attachments to the mm -hmm. father, and that that was trying to be controlled by the leader. Mm -hmm. And that's exa you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like it can happen in, you know, kind of like the parental relationship or in the relationship of a parent to a child. Um, but in the Sullivanians' case. Um, the children were either sent to boarding school extremely young, like as, as early as three or four years old, wow. or if they were raised in the community, they were uh, take it, often taken away from the biological parent and given to a non-biological parent to raise, yeah. or uh, in one case, given to like 10 people to raise. Mm -hmm. I, I have a friend who lived communally as a child with um, you know adult members of the community and was basically raised by 10 adult, um, uh, 10 adult uh, members of the community. So um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of like address that, that I think, you know, I see a lot of parallels with Oneida and the Sullivanians, and I just think it's kind of interesting to look at where uh, the similarities are and where the differences are. But I, I think that children and like romantic uh, relationships pose a problem to um, to the authority of leaders in, in cults, and so that often there are a lot of rules around that, around relationships, yeah. around kind of like um, you know creating rules around how uh, romantic relationships or sexual relationships are allowed to happen, or how child raising is allowed to happen. So. Um, that doesn't answer your question yeah. at all. I feel well, like I, I totally feel like a politician. Yeah, I have a yeah, politician. I have about that. Like, yeah, I have you know, one more thing. Like, <laughs> so basically, um, Fruitlands had the opposite problem. There was a disagreement about whether or not they should be like the shakers and completely go the path of celibacy, or if they could, should continue the family life they had. So the reason why Louisa May Alcott's mom eventually took her children and left was because the founder was, the other founder, Charles Lane, was trying to break up their family. He was mm -hmm. basically saying that uh, Bronson Alcott was still too attached to his kids, mm -hmm. too attached to his wife. A threat. Yeah, yeah. A, yeah. Th she w his wife was clearly disenchanted, to say the very least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the, the more attached he was to her, 
the bigger threat she posed to the whole commune. Mm -hmm. And Charles Lane was the one who'd actually bought the land. And so basically, that's why Louisa May Alcott's mom was like, I'm out of here. Because this guy was basically just trying to say, you can't have sex with your wife, and um, your attachment to your children is, uh, is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you're totally, I think this is a constant. It's oh, really yeah. wild. Absolutely, and I, I would say that I, the thing about posing a threat, this, this was ultimately like the downfall of the Oneida community was the, these, um, was the, the children um, and, uh, and like the younger generation and uh, the, the, the biggest points of contention were these like relationships that, that people had, like familial relationships and, and romantic relationships. Because um, one of their, their big tenets um, was that you, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, you can be with like a bunch of people if you want. It was like, you can only be with a bunch of people. You're not allowed to have monogamous relationships. It was considered special love. And uh, that was uh, not, that, that was not correct, that was not permitted. Um, and when they did eventually uh, start having children, when they implemented this uh, eugenics program, essentially, where they said, okay, well now we're gonna have kids, but um, we're gonna take the most spiritually pure people um, <laughs> and find like the ideal pairs to, to make the, the most spiritually pure child, um, they did, Tirza Miller, the woman whose diaries I base this off, uh, was paired with this guy Edward uh, that she didn't really know, because the cult was big enough that you could not really know a guy, which is impressive, honestly. Uh, uh, and I've, I've never read diaries from the 1800s that were so candid about sexual relationships um, and like really, uh, joyful, um, it, they were very moving, uh, but she describes like their, their first encounter and being nervous and embarrassed and um, they didn't have sex the first time because they're like, well, this is kind of awkward. Like they <laughs> paired us and they said that we should have a kid and that's weird, um, hi, I'm Tirza, nice to meet you, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like very, very odd. Um, but they ended up really falling in love. Like they, they ended up having a baby and uh, she really, truly loved this guy and that was not allowed. Uh, and she had been raised her whole life in this cult and uh, I've, I've written a lot of historical comics and I've done a lot of historical research for them and I feel like this was maybe the most emotionally difficult research that I've done. Um, like I had nights where I was reading this woman's diary and I just had to like close it and like take a minute and like I, like I cried reading this woman's diary because she, in her diary, was begging God to take these feelings away from her because she felt like they were sinful. Like she loved the father of her child and felt that it was wrong mm -hmm. and that she was committing a sin and begging for God to take the sin from her. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so heartbreaking. Um, and the, the leader noticed their, their relationship and like you mentioned, um, ended up barring Tirza from being able to see her child um, because he said like, this is too much of a connection to Edward and you have to break your special love with him. She loved music, she and Edward both loved music. And he said, you can't play music anymore. Um, you know, you and Edward, you can't make eye contact with each other. They weren't allowed to speak. They weren't allowed to make eye contact. Um, she wasn't allowed to play music. Uh, the, they had named their baby Haydn um, after the composer, uh, and Noyes changed his name to Paul because Haydn was representative of their bond with each other. Um, and Edward ended up leaving the community um, and asked Tirza several times to come with him to take Paul <laughs> and come with him. Um, and even years after he left the community, she writes in her diary about him coming back and being like, hey, it's been a couple of years. You still doing this? It's like, we're in love. And we could have a family. And she, she couldn't leave her uncle. That, I mean, that 
just that whole story is so familiar to me from like stories that I know of people in the in the Sullivanians where it you know it it was about the one in one romantic relationship being dangerous to the leadership but also the child being dangerous to the leadership and the and those two things being linked yeah and you know in in the Sullivanians it was also polyamorous and also seen as a very liberatory thing and um you know uh very much frowned upon if you got into a romantic attachment with one other individual yeah. they called it a focus like there was psychoanalytic language for it so in the sullivanians like this was all monitored through therapy sessions and um the therapy sessions would all kind of be um would all be uh relayed back to the top therapists and eventually to the top therapist who was Saul Newton and um you know any it was noticed if anyone was getting too attached to one other romantic to one romantic uh partner and um you know there were some somewhat unofficial rules around like you were not supposed to have more than I think two or three dates with one person in a week and it would be noticed if you did yeah. So um yeah and then if if you were getting very attached attached to someone it would be broken up. Mm -hmm. George I wanted to ask you and then I think I'm going to open it up to audience questions but you took a very different approach to children and the depiction of women. I wonder if you could talk about your uh how you dealt with those issues in your story. Yeah, I I didn't <clears throat> Like the cult in my story was kind of like background information. Uh, it, it didn't play a huge role in like the overall plot. Um, I wasn't as concerned about like the, the cult themselves and, and really like, the, like the, how they worked. Um, in the story, they're like, you don't see any characters. There's no panels like with action happening. It's all told through like text windows and like um, kind of like just clip art and stuff like that. So. There wasn't too much focus on like individual people or the or the rules of the group. I was really a, a more focused on uh, just telling the story of like this kid who's like kind of like this idiot teenager who's like um, kind of trying to save the world, but he doesn't really care about it. And he's like playing this video game, and this cult is is trying to like get him to like join the cult, and he and he's not doing it. Um, I don't really like drawing, like, I don't like drawing people in general, like, just drawing figures. I just, I suck at it. Like, it's just not fun for me. So it's like, I went, every story I try to make, I try to tell it in, in a different way, in a different focus that's not so much about, like, uh, people and their relationships. It's more about um, environment, aesthetics, um, design, text, that kind of stuff. Uh, I was thinking specifically, like, I didn't want to, uh, when I was doing the research for this, and I think the rest of you were kind of talking about this, like, I didn't want to sensationalize the cult in this book too much. I didn't want, because I know, like, the people that are in there are kind of victims, and I didn't want to, like, um, you know, exploit them in a way. So I really just wanted to have it as kind of background information. Um, you know, the leader of the cult is basically the devil, right? So he's just kind of possessing people and, and kind of using them. He's not really, uh, there's, people are not really in there of their own volition at all. Um, and, and that's why I kind of fictionalized everything as well. Like I kind of made up the cult. I made up their logo, their symbols and everything. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have about maybe 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes. And uh, there are some microphones, but if, uh, yeah, if you want to ask questions, please do. Just please speak up. <laughs> I apologize. This is a double question. Um, do you think growing up in a cult um, made it a habit for you to be connected to a, a group? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, actually, I think the opposite. Um, like, it sort of made me um, very aware of group dynamics and. Um, and uh, very self-conscious about expressing myself in a group. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the, the environment is so totalistic. It's so, like, um, it's so, uh, it, it's so interior. Like, you feel like you're, in, you're inside of it and it's your whole world. Um, and uh, I feel like it kind of conditioned me to um, 
to be to not speak up, to not um, give opinions. Like uh, it made me feel like I could get attacked at any time, and um, made me feel really vulnerable to group dynamics. So I, in, in a way, like kind of the opposite. But it's something that I've tried to uh, kind of unlearn over time because I also feel like there's a part of me that is so connected to like group activities and group ventures because that's all that I knew as a kid as well. Um, so there's a part of me that has like spent a, a lot of effort and a lot of time to kind of undo those fears and participate in kind of community-based things. And um, it's taken a long time, but I feel like actually in my early 50s, like I'm kind of there. <laughs> Thank so you. Um, one more is it is it um when you talk about it is it sensitive or emotional to you uh just in, in general the experiences of growing up in a cult or mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah of course absolutely um but um i also have uh also spent a lot of time trying to um you know, process those feelings and um, get to a place where I feel like it can be like normal, like to be able to have like public discussions of, you know, my experience for that to be a normal thing. Um, I put a lot of effort into trying to get there. Thanks. So, yeah. Any, anybody else have a question? Yes, please. Um, my question for Ellen is, um, I just visited the Fruitlands in Harvard, Massachusetts what? a few oh gosh, weeks ago. Um, so it was interesting to hear um, your uh, uh, perspective and story on it. And can you remind us of the work that you told that story in? Oh, I'm so oh it's in American Cult. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so Fruitlands is, I believe, the first story in American Cult. It's one of the earliest cults it's in... A, it's kind of vaguely chronological. So yeah. I mean, the third. Uh, pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you can read about that in American Cult. It is wild to me that... I, I, I know that there's still a, um, a museum. I, I can't... I don't know how it survived. They <laughs> were so bad at everything. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't and, last long. <laughs> and Charles Lane, who was the co-founder, did eventually end up uh, joining the Shakers. And so it wasn't like there was kind of a critical mass of people to preserve the property. So Kathy, we're going to have to talk about this because I, I need the whole story. Uh, yeah, over here. Yeah, um, appreciate you guys uh, writing the book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Uh, it's been my experience, you, cults sort of operate in, in different layers, almost like an onion. Uh, there's like the cult leadership and then there's the actual members, but there's also this sort of like and support the, the cult from the outside. That's something that you found and how to try to put that Who wants to take that one? Oh my <laughs> Were there Oneida flatware freaks who were just like, let's do this? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that I maybe didn't catch the, that like third element. Like there's the, the leaders and then... Or like fans, the, like supporters. Oh, like fans of the cult. Well, Is that correct? Like, yeah, just like there's a group that doesn't really understand the whole cult dynamics, but they think, hey, this is really cool and we like visiting from time to time and feeling like we're part of it even though they're not really oh. in the actual dynamics of the group. I, I think, it, at least for, for Oneida, they didn't, I think they were more in a, the type of cult where uh, they had sort of gone off and made their own community because they were like largely ostracized um, by surrounding areas, but you know, they did, they were incredibly successful at uh, running several businesses. Like we know them for the flatware company now because that survived like post them. They're like, okay, we're not a cult anymore, but this is going well, so we're gonna keep doing this. <laughs> um, but they, they had several factories where they like, they like made rope and they made like, you know, farm tools and like all kinds of other, like they had the publishing house for their own newspaper, but they printed other things for people. And so, you know, they conducted business with the outside community. And so, you know, 
uh, in that way were supported by outsiders, like financially, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say they had like, like fans in the way that uh, maybe more, I guess I'll use the word like a new agey kind of cult might yeah. have people that like come for a retreat or something and aren't necessarily part of like the, the inner circle. Uh, yeah, going over here. What do you, is this thing working? Okay. What do you think of the, like the interplay between cults and stuff like government and military and stuff? Cause that changes like the whole dynamic, but it does happen. Is that something that you explore in stories and stuff? Do any of you want to oh respond? I mean, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump in there because sure. why not? Please. So <laughs> in my current comics, um, because it's been, a few, uh, it's been a little while since American Cult has become a big success, um, it's now published by Silver Sprocket. Get your copy, Silver Sprocket. Yes. Um, <laughs> the tables here, except, Emmy, I didn't find yours. So uh, you could share at the end, but sorry, silver, Ellen, please go ahead. Silver Sprocket and Paper Rocket. Yes. Silver Sprocket, Paper Rocket. I mean, you can't forget that. Um, in my current comics called Lost Diamonds, which are about gender and baseball history, um, there are intersections between baseball and cults. Um, baseball is a lot like the military, but I'll leave that to <laughs> one enough. side. Um, because basically, uh, women have, not been, have basically been shunned by the world of professional baseball. But there was a cult in Michigan called the House of David, um, which is the cult that is featured in the Golem's Mighty Swing, if anyone has read James Sturm's classic. Um, and basically, they had a traveling baseball team. And they, they played with a really fantastic female pitcher named Jackie Mitchell, who was banned from minor league baseball after she struck out Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth in a <laughs> exhibition game. And so... <laughs> Cults just keep popping up. I mean, you can, I, I'm, I don't know if you can research anything in America and not turn up a cult. Oh, 100%, <laughs> absolutely. So I think we have time for one more, maybe? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so it seems to me that these online political communities have often been called cults. I don't think they're technically cults, but I was just wondering if there are parallels you see and if there's anything we can learn from the cults of the past to these communities today. And, and, George, that might be one for you. In yeah, terms of online yeah. Cults. A, a strong leader, right? Like a, a charismatic leader that's like everyone's dogmatically following, right? That's like one of the biggest hallmarks of, of a cult compared to a religion. Um, the very insular, like kind of alienating the outsiders, like keeping outsiders away, right? I, I see this a lot in politics. Um, I guess it's not quite a cult. They don't really work together as like a, a an a real life community, right? It's all online. So maybe it is kind of like uh, the new digital cult that, that is like emerging in this, in this time. Yeah. I, I also think that um, there's a, a phenomenon where an, an overarching ideology uh, might not in and of itself be a cult, but might have enough of the hallmarks that it's like really a uh, fruitful breeding ground for like little mini cults where yeah. there's a space for an inf for an influencer to pop in there and kind of uh, kind of fill the role of a prophet um, and become step into that void where the charismatic leader doesn't exist uh, I feel like we just scratched the surface yeah. oh of cults gosh. but I want to thank you guys uh, thank all the panelists <laughs> Um, you can find their books at these tables. Emmy, do you want to shout out your uh, table? Yeah, I'm actually uh, not tabling, oh, but not. I will okay. uh, shout out to my students who are tabling at J14, uh, awesome. selling their anthologies football. So go check them out. Awesome. Thank you all. <laughs>